Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us in the what and why of plan giving for 2021. My name is Whitney. I'm the Director of Alumni and Donor Engagement. Without further ado, I'd like to pass it on to John Hankins, who is our Director of Major Gifts. John? Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you so much, Whitney, for the introduction. And also wanted to um, recognize another one of um, Whitney and I's colleagues um, helping with today's technology, and that's um, Eric Dang. So Eric, thank you so much. Um, as uh, Whitney said, my name is John Hankins, Director of Major Gifts. I've been with uh, Davenport University for almost three years now, and I work on a team of nine um, uh, representing our Office of Advancement at Davenport University. And so just want to personally welcome all of you. I, I know that there's former faculty, staff, um, a variety of uh, individuals, donors on this call today. So we're, we're just thrilled that you're here to learn a little bit more about our legacy program and the climate um, that that is happening out there around plant giving. And so um, I'm going to be introducing two speakers today. We're thrilled to bring to you kind of a panel discussion, if you will. Uh, Bill Dolant is a 91 alum from Davenport's former Detroit College of Business in um, uh, Dearborn, Michigan. Um, Bill and his family reside in Southeast Michigan. Um, he's a financial advisor with RWS Financial Group. And RWS um, has a statewide presence um, with their financial advising from Detroit to Grand Rapids to um, Byron Center. They're opening a new office um, shortly. And so we're very thrilled to have his presence as an alum and uh, an expert on all things um, when it comes to um, planned giving tools, if you will. And then we're going to be inspired by uh, Suzanne Callahan, who is a Legacy Society member, her and her husband, Jerry. And she's going to talk about the why. Why, why philanthropy for their family and why Davenport University? And so um, let's go to the next slide here, please. Over the next 40 minutes, you're going to briefly get some information around what is Legacy Society and um, how does one join that um, to Bill's update on planned giving in a post-pandemic era, followed by Suzanne's story of, of why I give. And finally, I'm going to touch on um, a few simple planned giving tools. Some of it will be overlap to what you hear from Bill. And um, we just want to be here as a resource for you um, as you continue to, um, you know, build your goals and, and think about um, giving back uh, to your local community in Davenport. So what is our Legacy Society? Essentially, every nonprofit and every college has a Legacy Society that helps leverage really critical long-term funds um, for the institution's growth. So we all know um, when you make a gift to an annual fund, that in many cases helps not only student need today, it helps with the operations. Legacy giving is, is looking at a gift today during your lifetime or once you've passed through your estate plan, most likely. And some individuals utilize a will, some use a livable trust, but either way, it's very common, in fact, over 70% of donors nationwide that, that do plan giving make their gift through their estate plan. And so you're going to learn more about that today. And we have roughly 80 donors, uh, very dedicated to Davenport's mission, that at some point in their lives have decided to add Davenport to their, their strategy uh, in, in philanthropy. And so we're, we're very um, grateful for, the, for their continued support of, of our institution. So back to Whitney's uh, uh, piece on um, polling, we want to know right now, how familiar are you with planned giving? Um, there's some multiple choice um, answers here. And so maybe this is your first time learning about planned giving. Um, maybe you get things in the mail and you're like, I don't really know what this means. Or maybe you've, you've sat down with your financial planner and attorney and you've You've already looked at um, your, your future um, plans for your family. And so maybe this is just additional information today. Either way, we just want to have a baseline so that in 20, 25 minutes, we can kind of 
do a, a barometer check, if you will, and just see, see, hopefully we're doing our jobs, right, Bill? <laughs> and we're, we're sharing some information with you guys um, so that um, you feel more aware of, of what your options are in the future. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Bill Gaunt. Um, Bill, uh, take it away, sir. All right. Uh, thanks a lot, John, and thank you to all of you for uh, looking at this uh, presentation. And so um, basically, there's obviously many different ways that you can give to many different charities. And so to what John said, certainly we're going to talk about maximizing, you know, those goals, saving taxes. Uh, there's been updates to what are called required minimum distributions, meaning at age 72, everyone has to start taking those dollars out of uh, their retirement plans. IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, 457bs, all of those things. Um, it used to be at age 70 and a half, and now it's age 72. And then uh, lastly, the life insurance giving options. So if we go to the next slide, please. So one of the, the big things here is if you do have to take a required minimum distribution, there's something called a QCD. And what the QCD stands for is Qualified Charitable Distribution. So much like required minimum, they're both distributions, okay? So if you want to make a charitable distribution from your IRA, um, basically it's uh, a form, you get a hold of whatever charity that is because you want to have it named to the exact name of that charity. But at any rate, here's the rules. So it has to come from a traditional or an inherited IRA. So as I mentioned earlier, you have to take money out of your 401k, your 403b. You would transfer those dollars first into an IRA before you would make this uh, distribution. So a lot of you also have what are called inherited IRAs. So maybe you got that from um, father, daughter, or excuse me, father, uh, mother, you know, grandparents. And if that's the case, then the beneficiary on that particular contract, meaning you, would have to be at least 70 and a half for this to happen. And then the distribution that you take out must go directly to that qualified charity. And then uh, lastly, you have to receive a confirmation letter from the charity that states, I didn't receive any goods or services uh, in exchange for the contribution. Next. So the QCD, again, the Qualified Charitable Distribution, maximizes value and your gift as well as saving taxes. So what we're showing here is taxpayers who elect to itemize deductions. So if you're not itemizing, meaning you're taking the standard deduction, so the standard deduction for a single person is just went up 12,550 is the number. For uh, married couples, it's $25,100, okay? So again, that's the standard deduction if you do not itemize. However, in order to make you know, this distribution from your, um, your IRA as tax efficient as possible, you actually have to itemize. And so now let's walk through this chart. So for 2020, uh, maximum allowable above the line reduction to what's called adjusted gross income. And all this really means is if, let's just say you made $150,000, this is your adjusted gross income, all right? And then you make a contribution of cash, well, there's no deduction for that. If you make a contribution of appreciable, appreciated marketable securities, again, there's no above the line um, against your adjusted gross income. However, the one thing that you can do is a qualified charitable distribution. So it says the lesser of $100,000 or amount donated. All right, so the most you can uh, pull out of requirement of distribution and transfer to a qualified charitable or qualified charity is 100 grand or anything less than that, okay? So then below that, it speaks to excess that can be carried forward and used in future years. This will make a little bit more sense when we go further down. So again, um, whether it's cash, appreciated marketable securities, or the qualified charitable distribution, um, there is no excess that we can carry forward. Whatever you donate in that particular year, uh, it can't go over 100,000. And so if it does, you're certainly allowed to give it you just won't get the deduction above that $100,000 or whatever it amount it is that you donated. So then the next line speaks to adjusted gross income, but no, not yet. Uh, adjusted uh, gross income, so it's an optional standard deduction. Again, no deductions whatsoever. So now we look down below where it says plus. And so maximum allowable below the line charitable deduction. So let me just back up the boat real quick. Um, again, if you made $150,000, all right, 
and then you donated $100,000, effectively your tax return would say, well, you we're only gonna tax you on $50,000. Again, not giving tax advice, kind of an extreme example, but certainly tech, you know, check with whoever your tax advisor is in that regards. But then getting back to the uh, below the line uh, uh, objects that you can you take there. So um, amount donated. So again, if you're gonna make a charitable distribution, uh, or excuse me, a charitable contribution, you can donate that. So that's what it's saying. If it's cash, okay, you can take that off the bottom line. Again, if you're not itemized, or excuse me, if you're not taking the standard deduction. Then you move over to, let's just say you bought Amazon, maybe you're fortunate enough to have bought Amazon at 50 bucks. So now it's at 2,250. Well, guess what happens if you sell that stock and it's not in an IRA? So uh, you would owe taxes on the difference in the gain. So you paid 50, it's now worth 2,250. So taxes are due on $2,200 of every single share. So that's a, a good reason to maybe put those dollars to use uh, via a charitable contribution there. And then the last one, the, char the qualified charitable distribution, you can see is just not applicable for all three of those. Um, so I don't wanna get too deep in the woods, but certainly what this is basically saying is that you can take money, well, the money that you have to take out of your IRA for required minimum distributions, uh, instead of you taking it and you getting taxed on it, you can actually donate that to obviously Davenport University or other favorite charities that you may have, and they get the full amount. So there's no taxes that comes out of it before it goes to the charity, and you have satisfied your required minimum, required minimum distribution. And so that's why it makes it so much, uh, much more tax efficient versus if you just took the money out, paid the taxes, and then you're gonna pay the difference, whereas that charity could have obviously received uh, all of that dollars instead of you paying taxes on it. And then uh, just a little quick piece here too in regards to this itemizing uh, deductions and the donations. If you give dollars on a regular basis, a lot of people belong to you know churches and, and so forth, and they give whether that be weekly, monthly, whatever that might be, um, instead of doing it that way, why not consider doing it in a lump sum fashion and then that way they can get these dollars um, and without any taxes. So you're giving them more, they're receiving more, and there's no change in your taxes. So just kind of thought I'd throw that in there. Um, if you're fortunate enough, okay, to so maybe, maybe you did buy the Amazon stock at 50 and it's at 2,250, you own 100 shares. Huge tax liability, good problem to have versus not having it, I suppose. Um, but by uh, donating those assets to the charity, so you're allowed to deduct up to 60% of that. Okay, 60% of your adjusted gross income. So if it's $100,000, then you can you know, uh, <clears throat> deduct 60,000. Well, yeah, Bill, but it was worth even more than that. Well, if it was worth even more than that, you're allowed to take this forward another four years in your tax returns. Meaning that if there is an overage, there is an excess, you can apply it to next year's taxes or the following year or however that works out for you, you have up to five years to do that. So again, it's very tax efficient you know, in that regard. Um, again, the charity getting more dollars versus less, all right? So obviously, there's, I shouldn't say obviously, but there's lots of tax brackets, and of course, there's legislation, and who knows what that's going to look like next year's uh, tax brackets. Again, this isn't all of the tax brackets, but generally speaking, these are the tax brackets uh, that the uh, uh, DU's uh, donors belong in, all right? And so we have the single rates. We also have the married filing jointly rates. You can see they're basically just double. You know, if it's single, it's one number. If it's married, it's just double that amount. All right, so when you hit age 72, there's something called the required minimum distribution. Again, previously it was age 70 and a half. That's now 72 years of age. It's not 72 and a half. It's just that year that you turned 72. So the old table said that you have to take out 25.6%, excuse me, it's a factor we use, I, you can use either way, but you figure, let's see, for either easy math, you have $100,000, you know, that you have to take out, or excuse me, you have $100,000 in your IRA. The IRS is saying you have to divide that number by 27.4. All right, so this will give you the calculation of the requirement of distribution. So we started out with the married filing jointly. So again, age 72 is when you have to start taking those dollars out. We're just going to assume that the, uh, the couple has a million dollars in IRAs. And so therefore, if you took that million dollars and divided it by that factor, the 
that comes out to $36,500. That's what you have to take out. If you don't take it out, then the IRS uh, will penalize you 50%, five zero, plus all taxes are due. So you certainly don't want to not take your required minimum distribution. So now let's just follow that through. So that million dollars, you have to take out 36,500. We're assuming your household has $100,000 income. And then now you added this 36,500 to it. And the IRS looks at it as, well, that's household income. So you put the two together and you fall in the federal tax bracket of 22%, which is the, the highest tax bracket for that uh, particular income. And then you look below it. So now you did donate the 36,500. So the $100,000 income, you added the 36,500 and then you took it away. So obviously we're still at $100,000. So you're still in the federal tax bracket, 22% would be your highest uh, tax bracket. A little bit different when you look, look below at the single scenario, same age, we're just gonna cut that um, IRA in half, call it $500,000, same factor, 27.4. And so again, it's half of that. So 18,250 is what you're required to take out. So now we're going to assume your annual household income is $70,000. Now we add that 18,250, and now your income is at 88,250. 88, your federal tax bracket is 24%. Below, if we actually donated that full 18,250, you can take a look at following that through, 70,000 plus the 18,250, subtract out the 18,250 18, because you donated it, your income 70,000, well your tax bracket actually went down the highest tax bracket is actually 22%. And again, not giving tax advice, so certainly you know, uh, talk to your tax advisor. All right, so that was the RMDs that everyone has to take when you turn age 72. This is something different. We're still talking about a retirement account, but just look at the bullet points here. So after age 59 and a half, you can take penalty for withdrawals from your account as needed to serve, you know, support your retirement income. So even though you're going to list the beneficiary as your, or the charity as your beneficiary, you still have full access to these dollars until in fact you pass away. So that's what it speaks to below that. So after age 72, you still have to take those dollars out. It's still your account. The beneficiary is the charity, you're the owner. Uh, you can also you know, make subsequent beneficiary changes if you like. So I've been in this business quite a few times and obviously things can change. Uh, familial, you know, circumstances, uh, charitable circumstances, whatever that might be. So once you get that beneficiary, you're not into that person, uh, that trust, or whatever that is. You're always allowed to change it, okay? And it doesn't have to be 100% beneficiary. You can decide, I want this charity to get 20%. I want this other charity to get 30%. And I want my family to get, you know, 40% or however you, you know, slice that up. Certainly not 100% there but that's the idea, you're gonna, you know, whatever you're gonna do with 100% of it. So then bottom line there, during your lifetime, again, this is big, you can take withdrawals, so it doesn't have to be required minimum distributions, but you can certainly take withdrawals, it's your money. And then 72 and a half or older, you have to take out required minimum distributions, and that's when, you know, taxes are applicable, but certainly you can avoid those by using the last scenario. All right, so again, creating a charitable legacy. This is life insurance. The last slide we talked about was actually uh, retirement plans. So life insurance here says, okay, there's a couple different ways to do this. You're gonna designate the charity as a beneficiary, again, on some or all of the policy death benefit. The beneficiary doesn't have to be a you know all or nothing round. You can pick multiple charities. You can pick one charity and say, they're gonna get 20% of it and my family's getting the other 80. So however you, you want to do that, this is just the way uh, by uh, designating a beneficiary. You still own the policy, you still have full access to the cash value uh, via partial surrenders or loans. You'd be the one responsible for taxes when you take those dollars out um, upon your demise, then whatever portion you, you decided to put uh, towards the charity, then certainly they would get that. So same idea, all right? Um, and what this is showing here, again, partial surrenders and policy, policy loans, you have full access to that. Okay, and so while we did that beneficiary change, say we did it now, we, we're not gonna die for another 15, 20, 30 years, who knows? So when we sign now that we wanna put the, whoever, the charity, obviously Davenport is, a ch is the beneficiary, we put that in now, but nothing saying that you can't wait until later, but effectively, this is a scenario as it plays out. You do this today, tomorrow, whenever you do this, okay? 
All you're doing is making the charity a beneficiary. They're not gonna be the owner of the life insurance policy. They're just gonna be a beneficiary. You still have full access, again, to everything in there until you pass away, keeping in mind that you can always change the beneficiary. And so if you wanted to get 50% instead of 20%, uh, John would appreciate that as well. So that's the idea. So I've been talking about certainly you can lower it, increase it, so you can change that uh, percentage whenever you want. All right, so now this is still a life insurance policy, but what this is saying is you're actually giving it away uh, to the charity immediately, all right? So it's an irrevocable gift uh, of this policy to the charity. So effectively, the charity is the owner of the policy. So you're still the insured, meaning that nothing pays out until you pass away, all right? Now this is irre irrevocable, meaning that once you do this, you can't take it back. All right, so this is typically your more higher net worth uh, that they've done gone through other uh, ways of giving and now they, they see this final way and like, okay, I need to get some money out of my estate. My estate is too large. I've already taken care of uh, my family in that regards. Um, when I you know pass away, they'll be all taken care of. Um, so now this chunk will go directly to the charity. So again, it's uh, they have access to the cash value uh, your donor, however, so why would I do that, Bill? Because you get the tax deduction. The donor gets the tax deduction uh, for that. And then, you know, a lot of people will pay one time. They throw one chunk of money into it. It's called a, a single premium life insurance policy. But more people are much more familiar with the traditional uh, where you just pay, maybe that be on an annual or quarterly basis. So again, those are still your premiums, meaning you're going to pay them. The charity owns the policy. The policy is on your life. So it's just a little bit different in that you don't have access to any of these monies. What you're doing is you're giving this 100% away right from, you know, right from the jump, very first start. The other scenario, you're putting the charity as a beneficiary. So that's basically the different, you know, some of the different things that you can certainly do here. Kind of went through that relatively fast, maybe too fast, I don't know. But certainly, you know, any questions you might have out there, please let me know. I just saw the question and disappeared. You're gonna, are you gonna announce the questions here, John? Or I'm happy to help. That was a wonderful uh, presentation, Bill. Thanks for all the very um, uh, thoughtful tools um, that naturally uh, people on this call can take from this webinar today and um, break down even more with their financial advisor, like you like you uh, recommended. And so, mm -hmm. great great resources. Um, Mike Hubble asks, um, can an RMD, so the required minimum dis distribution contributions happen after end of calendar year and before tax filing date and be counted in the previous calendar year? Great question, Mike. Right, so the rule previous to this latest one was 70 and a half. You'd actually wait, you're allowed to wait the first year and first year only until the filing date of the following year. So that's not uh, an ongoing thing. I need some, I, I can't say exactly, I can double check on that for you, Mike. But generally speaking, it's first year only under that. Um, so it allows you, but the problem with that is now you're taking two distributions in that one year and that very well could place you in another tax bracket. So again, another tax question, talk to your you know, tax advisor in that regard, does, does this make sense or not? So hopefully I answered your question, Mike. Wonderful. Another um, participant in the audience asks, uh, which is the most attractive tax savings vehicle for making estate gifts, wills or livable trusts? Well, effectively, um, wills is a, you know, is a, uh, it's actually not a contract. Uh, courts don't have to follow a will. Generally speaking, they do. So wills can be contested. So think about Elvis who had seven wills and, you know, who knows where those all came from, but it was whoever the last, what was the last will, but they can be contested whereas a trust is actually a legal and binding contract, okay? The courts always follow that, but they're not obligated to follow a will because real quickly, let's just say you have three children and one of them turns out to be a bad apple and you say, well, they're getting cut out. So now I'm only gonna split it 50-50. Well, if that child finds out and then uh, your estate goes to probate, they can file a claim and they will get theirs regardless. Uh, because it, it's dealt with the secession laws of Michigan, um, because whether you have a will or you don't have a will, that that's what'll happen. However, if you have a trust, 
that's what makes it ironclad. So again, talk to an estate planning attorney, not just any old attorney, make sure they do estate planning and then they can walk you down that road as well. So it's not so much a question of taxes, it's a, it's a, it's a question of control, frankly. Great, thank you, Bill. Thanks for those, those questions, everybody. All right, Bill, we really appreciate your leadership on this. And um, yes, let's uh, transition to the next slide here. So we we got a good baseline earlier. It seemed like there was a lot of folks that have some comfort and familiarity with, um, you know, plan giving. How do you feel now? Um, do you feel like you have more of an increased awareness? Um, more questions, perhaps, to break down with with your financial advisor or an attorney? Um, is there anything that just was like, wow, never knew that before? Responses are coming in. I'm seeing kind of a combination bill between um, somewhat more comfortable and much more comfortable. So that's great. Mm, six, okay, so 60% somewhat more comfortable, 40% much more comfortable. Hey, awesome. We're here just to help facilitate all this. So we, were, we appreciate you guys taking a moment to kind of check in with us. Thanks again, Bill. Sure, absolutely. Okay, next slide, please. Now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, colleague Suzanne Callahan um, on why she and Jerry give and why they give back to Davenport University. So Suzanne, take it away. Great, thanks, John. Um, and yes, I learned a lot, Bill. I'm glad to uh, glad to be here today. Um, I. Uh, was really happy that John asked me to come um, and talk today. I have been a super fan of Davenport University for a long time. I actually um, am employed by Davenport University now um, and have been affiliated with the university for a very long time. I'm in my 25th year, believe it or not, with the university. And I look just like that. Um, so I wanted to tell a little bit about our story and hopefully this is um, makes an impact on the audience today. Um, Jerry and I, pictured here, grew up in a solid middle class families with very level of educational attainment by our parents, but definitely um, the belief that education through and beyond high school to include college was a focus. Um, having a curiosity for learning and being a contributor personally and professionally to our community was a common thread in both of our families. Um, my husband and I have long ties, um, and actually when I said I work here, um, both of us have actually worked here. Um, and we were working here right at the time we started our family. Um, as I think about it now, um, I, I really do see how the words of Emmy Davenport, make a living, make a life, make a contribution, really resonated with our own um, philosophy or mission, if you will, for our young little family there. Um, we began saving for our own children's college education, pictured here, that's little Jack, um, who is now 23, Hannah, who is now 21, and that little tiny guy in the front there is Connor, who is now 19 and not so tiny. Um, before they, we started saving for their college before they even started school. It was a priority for us. Um, even with our savings for our children, we have still had them start to make a living and contribute in a sig significant manner to their own educational expenses. Um, it's no 100% funding from mom and dad on our side. Um, while we were not in dire financial situations growing up, Jerry had student loans and he was one of six kids. My family invested more in my dorm expenses than they paid annually for their mortgage. Um, as they were incredibly frugal and clearly put the focus on their kids and my, or me and my education. They were providing for my brother and I, saving for their own retirement and living well within their means, um, where we did not go without anything we needed. I paid my own tuition, so like my husband, um, I knew the impact of having my own skin in the game. Um, it's fairly common knowledge that there's a lasting impact on future earnings if you do not have access to certificate degrees, credentials. I mean, this has been my passion for years is 
education for life, right? Um, we established a, a scholarship at Davenport and have continued to contribute to Davenport as our family has grown. We recognize the power of a degree or a credential, and we are fully aware of the barriers that exist to educational and employment opportunities, if not for the support of the community. Um, if our scholarship can help a student avoid going into debt, for their education or allow them to earn a credential that leads to a higher wage, um, our investment is reaping a return. Um, I see the impact of the programs and degrees at Davenport um, in our community where I interact with employers every day on a local, regional, and international basis who are seeking to attract, hire, retain graduates from programs at Davenport. Um, our alumni benefit in their career based upon the, their time at Davenport. I love running into people and hearing their stories about how, oh, I love Davenport, and it changed my life. It's changing the trajectory of, of family trees um, once they've had an experience here. Um, it really, and I, I look at it, it's, it's a, a community thing, it's the economy. A thriving economy for, comes from community support for individuals seeking to better themselves through advanced education. Um, our family continues to pay it forward and, and anticipate that future generations will do the same. I mean, I, I look at that picture and think, wow, that was yesterday, and we started giving when we were young, um, and we'll keep doing that. Um, we are honored to be a part of Davenport's Legacy Society. And that's my story, John. <laughs> that's fantastic, Suzanne. Wonderful, wonderful story. Um, let's move to the next, yeah. Look Here at they the are, they're, they're a little gray hair. <laughs> <laughs> when was that family picture taken before the Q&A? Uh the, the big family picture, I think that was actually when Hannah graduated high school and she is now a college graduate. Actually, Hannah is currently um, pursuing her MBA at Davenport University right now. I just got a note the other day from one of our faculty members and said, how did that happen? So there you go. We are uh -huh. Davenport through and through. Uh, that's, that's fantastic. Um, and uh, for those on the call, um, uh, when uh, Suzanne mentioned that uh, Jerry at one point worked at Davenport. Um, J Jerry's got an incredible story. He actually was hired by um, past president, the late uh, Don Main. And uh, Jerry says, you know, Don hired me to essentially hardwire all of the campuses statewide back when the internet was a, a new thing. <laughs> and so he's, he's made, your, your husband's fantastic and just um, look forward to meeting your kids at some point. Um, thank you for sharing your, your story with us. Um, you truly have um, established a legacy with, with Davenport's mission, so. No problem, thanks. So Q&A, please, the next slide. Uh, let's take a, uh, one or two questions from the audience. We're still um, 10 minutes on, on track here. We wanna get everyone out of here at 12, 12.45 as promised. So are there any comments or questions from the audience? I do see one, John, over there from Megan. Um, uh, what was helpful for Jerry and I in putting together a planned gift for the scholarship? Well, um, I did mention it was particularly easy for us because we were um, very engaged with Davenport at the time and had personal relationships with people at Davenport. and. Um, we saw the work that was happening and uh, from a from the administrative paperwork, all that side of it, people like John, um, John wasn't here then, but um, others were. And it was a pretty simple process to start that. And aside from me, working here now, um, we've stayed in constant contact with the, the donor folks and um, we've been able to see the recipients of our scholarships. We get updates on who has um, been the beneficiaries. Um, uh, this is a little side, I guess my answer is a short answer. It was easy. The, the whole team that John mentioned, the nine people made it really easy and handled all the paperwork. And um, it was, we, we didn't have uh, lots of treasure back at the time. Um, and as as, as, our, as that has changed a little bit, it's always been really easy. Um, one little side note is that we, um, 
did discover through hearing who some of our scholarship recipients were that one of the recipients actually unrelated to this specifically was working at my husband's organization in the tech area and the help desk and so that was really cool to to take a personal interest in one of our recipients that he probably wouldn't have had that particular job had he not had the opportunity to get his technology training at davenport university so um easy process and we've personally seen the um, rewards. Thanks. That's amazing. Thank you again, Suzanne. Okay, next slide, please. So you might be asking yourself or in the near future, how do I go about establishing and, and growing my legacy at Davenport University? Well, you just heard a great example from Suzanne and Jerry in terms of setting up a named endowed scholarship. Davenport University has close to 300 named endowed scholarships today. Um, those are through individuals as well as companies. And um, it's, it's a very um, simple way and a beautiful way to start looking at leveraging growth of Davenport's endowment uh, to support future students that have that um, financial tuition need. Um, in fact, 95% of our students have some form of financial need. And so um, when we think of establishing a legacy, we'd love to hear from you in the future because, you know, I think of one of um, the 10 new Legacy Society members um, that came in this year and to respect her confidentiality from a donor standpoint, I'll just call her Betty. And Betty um, got her associate's degree in accounting probably about 28 years ago at the original Fulton Street campus in Grand Rapids. Many of you on the call are familiar with that campus. Um, she loved the education from the get-go in terms of the adjunct working faculty that really understood the market and were out working and teaching at the same time. She came back in 2019 to retool and took a, um, a, a much more new uh, accounting class. In fact, her employer at her CPA firm um, in West Michigan really advocated for her to, to go um, do a leap of faith and go back to school. And she said two, two reasons in terms of her goal of est establishing an endowed scholarship. One was that she really, really was impressed with how the faculty 30 years ago and today are just so knowledgeable and, and so tangible with what they're providing. Um, she was just blown away how that hasn't changed. In addition to that, and this is very um, common in um, this legacy program, she wanted, her and her husband Bill wanted to honor um, uh, Betty's late sister, who was a nurse young in her career in her 20s at Holland Hospital and uh, benefited by scholarship support when she was in college and lost her life to cancer. And so they kind of tied a, an honorarium scholarship into why Davenport, well, she's benefited as a working professional. But either way, um, establishing that goal and then determining what the criteria is for your scholarship or things we can help you with. In their case, they wanna support future nurses in their junior and senior year um, who really have a need for financial assistance and they learned that through our College of Health in the case for support there. And so we can help guide you on what you wanna do. Um, and they met with their um, attorney back in January and added Davenport University to their estate plan to establish that future scholarship. So thank you so much um, for being here today. Um, like I mentioned and others on the call, we are here to help facilitate your goals. Um, we are not the experts in tax or um, legal matters. So reach out to your attorney or financial planner for further conversations. And as always, we are here as a resource for future conversations. Our um, general phone number is down below as well as our general email address. And um, one of our fundraising um, colleagues would be happy to have further conversations with you um, post post this webinar. This also has been recorded, and so it will be shared with um, folks that weren't able to attend today. And if you also would like a copy of this, we're happy to share that with you. It was a lot of content, and so um, we understand, and we just want to make this as simple as possible for you all. So thanks again for your time today, and um, make it a great week.